world, things look a little bit different around here. Um, yeah, things look a little bit different around here right now. There is a ton of stuff that I have been really just working myself half to death on. Getting off work, um, immediately diving into things, um, trying to get some stuff sorted. You guys can notice in the background the colors are changing. Um, there's a lot of things that I have been promising you guys that uh, I was going to do. And I have started them. Now, where the big one of the big questions is, where am I in the end of the death part two? Sanguinius has encountered Horus. Sanguinius stands in front of Horus. Alanius Pius has just pointed out the warp has entered the Imperial throne. It is time. Everyone, I have been looking forward to this book for quite some time. I have been looking forward to this book for an eternity, and it's finally out. So while I've been in here painting, I've been listening to this book non-stop. So from the second I stand up, I, like I have gotten the wall behind me is finished. This all is finished right here. There's going to be, I actually have everything in here now, all the artwork, everything that I said that I was going to be doing. It's just about done. I'm debating with myself if I'm going to move this table over a little bit or not. I don't know. Uh, you guys let me know the perspective, how you guys like it, um, once it is finished. Oh. Oh, my God. There we go. One second. Now, one of the problems that did come about because of this, uh, one, of the, one of the problems that did come about, I hope you guys can hear me good from where the mic is for right now. If not, please let me know. Um... What has wound up happening is um, I have not been able to fully set up my table yet. In fact, I got to pull things out and um, do a second coat on here, here, and there, and everything else like that. But everything is kind of looking okay. And what better stream? Thank you, Josh Tompkins. Uh, best part of this episode was is <laughs> creamy sheep. This is creaming time. <laughs> uh, is that better? I hope that's better, guys. That should be better. Um, I this is the first time I've uh, started trying to record anything. Uh, this is the first time I started trying to record anything since um, I readjusted. So. Um, yeah, there, there was a slight echo. It's mainly because the audio reset on everything. I actually dropped my microphone. That's why I was a little bit late coming in because I had to readjust all my microphone settings. Everything had to be redone. But, <sighs> guys, I really can't wait to, I really can't wait for you guys to see um, what this is going to look like when it's done. Um... I really can't wait for you guys to see this because I have been wanting to do this for quite some time. Um, Hobbit, the sound still hasn't changed for you. Thanks, just some guy. The dark side of the paint is a gateway to live streaming stuff. Some con some say to be considered unnatural. Uh, let's see. Now I'm gonna try to move my microphone over just a little bit more. It's not hooked to its natural assembly right now. It really is not. Um, so just bear with me Is that a little bit better tell me if that's a little bit better for you guys if it's not I'll see if there's anything I can do um, coming up the Senate and Sharknado have an anime tool <laughs> and the mechanic is ask Omega for the Wi-Fi password and the site makes a critical decision <sighs> tonight on Fox has anybody seen the fan yet 
Has anybody seen Fan? I'm going to love this episode. Yeah, the mic's, the mic's currently over there. Normally it hangs down like right above where I'm, like right above my head, somewhere off to the camera side around here. And, um, yeah. I'm ready to go. X in chat if you're ready. What better stream to show you guys what is coming for the, the background, everything else like that. What better way than on this stream? On this stream that I look forward to every single time. I look forward to this. I look forward to the time I spend with you guys. I look forward to fans, fans coming in to spend time with us. I look forward to everything else. And guys, it is here. It's here now. X and chat if you're ready. Go ahead. Why to nuke profit before we even begin? He got stabbed in the hand? What did he get stabbed in the hand for? So, it's two hours. Yes, Mr. Galaxy Y, thank you. I did realize that fan uploaded. Hey, War Monkey, what's going on, bud? Welcome to it. Hobbit, thank you. X to summon the fan. Guys, I'm so used to looking over here because my camera's usually over here. But I kind of like this a little bit more. Let's get into it. I'm not going to get all through all this tonight. There's no way I can. But let's get into it. Oh, it's been too long been waiting on this. we go. No. Ayla Sakura's whispered exhalation seemed to ripple through the suffocating air <laughs> of the rent and ruined makeshift prison. Behind her Fan cerulean yep. eyes, Ayla's very spirit was awash in a storm of emotions which threatened to tear her asunder even more than she already was. Her beaten form lay sprawled on the ground, shattered in flesh, soul left ringing in the wake of what she even now bore witness to. Looming before her were the very avatars of her worst nightmares. Darth Sidious the malevolent puppet master behind the galaxy's most recent galactic war, and Inquisitor Tar Weiler, the inscrutable, grinning monster who hailed from another universe entirely. Quick thought, quick thought. If you combine Creamy Sheev and Tar Weiler, you get Tartar Sauce. X in chat to nuke me. X in chat to nook me. Prophet, thank you. I really just got to start reading the heresy books. Stopped after Angron slayed the new Siri. Made you cry yourself to sleep. I would have thought it was after the pasting that the Night Lords got on Sotha, but still. The former's lips thank pulled you, back in thank that you, horrific expression that Ayla had learned to fear. The Inquisitor holding aloft a rapier that seemed to drip with abyssal fire. Both semblances of evil seemed so engrossed in their newfound rivalry, so locked by their mutual challenge, that they paid her, broken and inconsequential as she was, no mind at all. Ayla felt some form of gratitude for that, but the sensation was fleeting. Cast out of her the instant the two men chose to engage each other. The moment was as sudden as the arrival of an unexpected death, and twice as shocking. Ayla watching as the two approached each other and paused, 
Weiler's weapon roiled and moaned as he held it casually in one hand. Sidious's two blood-shaded sabers humming at either... Okay, I'm saying it right now. I want them to, to combine forces. I am all team tartar sauce at this point. Let's go. Their side of a Dark Lord's shrouded, black-robed body. The men seemed to flicker then, like black candle flames caught in a nearby breath. And by the time Ayla realized that their contest had Excellent truly begun, fan. the two shadows had already exchanged several empowered blows. Gusts of hurricane-like wind buffeted out from their collisions, throwing Jedi, wounded and corpses alike across the floors and into the walls. Their duel commenced with a savagery that was a study in contrasts, like a painting in which the brightest of whites clashed with the darkest of blacks, showing a- No matter what, she never recovers from this. Even if she survives this, she never recovers from this. Ayla is screwed. Ayla is screwed mentally. Like, she just- she just watched her entire order fall apart, and the two biggest bads- legitimately of the entire setting so far just stomped all over them and made it look made them look worthless by comparison thank you hobbit the tartar sauce heresy yes creamy sheave and tar weiler uh all you compare picture is iskander kaya and having a <laughs> have an heart attack yeah pretty much thank you mr gox thank you hobbit but yeah this is team like, they need to combine their forces. Let's go. Ayla I know, Tony, I'm just... shadow she had never even conceived of. Darth Sidious brandished twin crimson lightsabers, their blades glowing like demonic eyes in the strange murk that was rapidly consuming the ninth floor. Tarweiler's rapier, its blade of pitch darkness. Dude! Are you shitting me? Look at this! This is what that dude looks like? This is what Wyland looks like. Looks like a Romulan, a Vulcan, and a Krusty the Clown had a baby, abused it, pissed on it, left it in the woods for 30 days, then bleached it, and then set it loose on the world with a lot of anger issues and an angst. The hell? Just some guy. Remind her that on top of this, she still has her flashback memories of Biggie judging her. When she was fighting the sisters, she still has to face? Bruh, nah. Yeah, this is Tarweiler jump scare. Holy shit. That shamed even the night seemed to consume light itself, screaming through the air with each swing, leaving black arcs of fire in its wake. You truly believe that your childish sorcery can match the might of the Inquisition? Weiler sneered. The words spat out even as his rapier clashed with Sidious's lightsabers, spawning showers of malignant sparks which seemed almost alive as they flailed and flared to the steel ground. Arrogance. Ha! Ever the folly of the uninitiated. Sidious retorted, maneuvering his dual blades in intricate arcs, a graceful dance of death which shamed Ayla just to see it. My order has long mastered the mysteries of the universe. We do not need to brute force our way through it. The Force obeys, for it is our right to command it. The Sith Lord boasted, pressing his attack as he weightlessly slid and leapt about, never striking at the Inquisitor directly, always seeking to subvert Weiler's counter-strikes or offensives. Weiler was based on the a vampire? air around them surged with an invisible pressure that Ayla could almost hear. And, to the surprise of her bloodshot eyes, Sidious was doing what none of them had been able to. He was pressing Tarweiler, gaining gradual control of their mutual movement as he kept pace with the previously untouchable Imperial. Dude. Both combatants were clearly augmenting their physical abilities with techniques based within the immaterial worlds around them, empowering themselves such that the physical universe seemed to scream around them in its attempt to keep pace. 
They moved faster than Ayla's trained eyes could follow, blurs of lethal intent shattering themselves against one another, held intact through their impacts by the same forces which made those strikes so severe. Weiler's rapier stabbed and slashed with a serpentine grace, his movements winding and indirect. Like a snake's coils folding under itself, his every maneuver punctuated with a violent and sudden lurch forward. Meanwhile, Sidious's lightsabers wove a web of red, creating a wall of light. Okay, I actually preferred it when he was grinning like a maniac. I actually preferred it when he was grinning like a maniac. I do not like Sirius Weiler. ...that kept pace with the black serpent fang that was Weiler's weapon, catching and deflecting every blow thrown his way. Their conjoined arts of combat could have made small the likes of even Master Yoda. At least, that was what Ayla believed as she watched on. The room was buckling around them, waves of unseen power rippling and shimmering through the air, tearing open walls and rending apart the floors above them. The destruction and Thank you, contortion the the of the space is coming. around I don't doubt the defeated it. Jedi only seemed to excel. Dude, this scene is set up so fucking well. I'm just gonna say it. I'm just gonna say it. I, I have been saying this. I continue to say it. The sheer fact they're literally dueling on the corpses of hundreds of Jedi. What the hell? Accelerate then, as the physicality of the contest between the two shadow beings suddenly ruptured into overt displays of- Baron, ask yourself that question four times slowly. Four times slowly. Why was evil villain face allowed to join the Inquisition? Ask it again. To yourself, just- You'll get it. Trust me. The, the, the symbolism at play here is fucking baller, okay? The sheer fact that you have this powerful symbol of Imperial Might, which the Jedi have been fighting, and Sidious, which the Jedi have been trying to fight and failing to, well, trying to find and failing to do, and both of them are making mockeries of the Jedi, that's symbolism you can't beat. If Anakin shows up, the Eye of Terror would form. Doubt that, Mr. Galaxy. I don't know what's going to happen when he turns. I, I haven't even sat down and thought about it for a little bit. Jack Leonard, thank you. The only Jedi technique you can think of that would work against these two would be something called Oneness. Unfortunately, that one be invented for the next 30 years. And the only person that could probably stand up to them in, in a prolonged engagement, Mace Windu... Well, he's not going to be doing that for some time now because he's probably... God, we need to get back to Mace Windu at some point and explore what the hell's wrong with him. Let's go. Their respective dark arts. Sidious bounding up to the ceiling as he absorbed a particularly brutal strike, holding himself well, upside down statement. there as he extended his arms, cackling and laughing as waves of force lightning unfurled from his body and rained down. Weiler did not miss a beat, dancing back. Bolts of power bouncing off his blade and psychic radiance as he spun and attempted to contend physically with Sidious's arcane display. It almost gratified Ayla to see the Inquisitor be suddenly overwhelmed before countering almost. with torrents of black fire. The hungering flames carried aloft in an explosion of psychic malevolence which drove back the Sith lightning. And again... Ayla became aware that her surroundings seemed to waver and distort as the competition between them raged on. Reality itself I'm the sound the here, the unnatural sound forces mixing. being unleashed within it. The walls caved and folded, Jedi bodies both alive and dead being swallowed up into those metal confines as the steel around them seemed to breathe and grow, expanding and morphing as if chemically swollen from the abyssal alchemies which had been turned loose here. Even away from the walls, Ayla could feel the floor buckling and churning under her, melting and reforming without the aid of heat. Her heart Creamy she, maybe he's born with it, maybe it's Maybelline. Hammered as she looked back at their horrific duel. 
Wondering how her order was ever meant to stand before such twisted and unknowable powers. You're right, Trent. The clashing between the two became so rapid and so fearsome that the sound of it resembled a thrum, the intensity building and building, but it could not build forever, nor did it. Sidious drove down into the Inquisitor, splitting black flames with his red sword. Okay, seriously, the sound design of this is on point. Fan, you've outdone yourself, shit. Twirling, carried on winds of dark power as he slapped the crimson bars of his weapons against our Wilers. Dedicated defense. For his own part, despite having no second weapon, the Inquisitor was not struggling to keep up. At least, no more than Sidious was. Ayla watched them lock swords, watched Tarweiler kick Sidious in the chest, dropping his rapier into a lowered posture, secondary hand slapping against the back of the hilt, and launching into a rising lunge that the Dark Lord of the Sith only avoided by cartwheeling back and out of the way. It was clear by this point in the fight that Sidious knew every single form of lightsaber combat, with the possible exception of the latest form, Vapad. But where Sidious had mastered the battle arts of the Jedi and Sith, this Tar Weiler fought not with the martial teachings of two orders, but with the lethal wisdom of several hundred. For yeah, that's the one thing that is going to just that's going to be the one thing that just kind of separates the two in terms of that. The Imperium is a purely absolute martial society. Absolute martial. So. Forming out of his fighting style, a chaotic amalgamation composed of very nearly every single sword fighting technique that humanity had cultivated in 10,000 years of constant escalating war. It was within this melee storm of violence, this bloodthirsty exchange of galactically assembled martial prowess, that the Imperial Inquisitor eventually gained the upper hand. It happened so quickly that Ayla was not able to spot the exact moment that the rapier found its mark. Oh. Somehow sliding past Sidious's guard and scoring a searing line across the Sith Lord's chest. The two broke apart like powerful opposing magnets, Tarweiler grinning his monster's grin as he and Ayla watched Sidious rise from a crouch. A growing line of black flames spreading from his chest, oh. lighting his hidden face with darkness. Now it was Tarweiler who cackled, Ayla feeling a strange despair, realizing at long last that not a single being of her galaxy could stand against the predators that had come from somewhere else. The only thing that would make this better is the Fab Stodes. I'm just saying the Fab Stodes need to be here at this point, okay? Because they would be so screwed trying to figure out who to root for. Just, Ayla's screwed trying to figure out who to root for. Ayla is actually sitting there going, well... Better the demon we know at this point. Even the yeah, Sith this fight is wrecking her. No match, though one would not know it from the undaunted posture of the burning Dark Lord. Your lightsabers may cauterize flesh, but the fires of the warp consume the soul. Wyler hissed in victorious elation. You are finished. Food for the warp! Sidious looked down at the flames and grimaced, not from the wound, but from the realization that the duel had moved to a terrain where physical skill alone would not suffice to serve his purposes. They got more left. The hell. Baron Sparta was also a society focused on devotion to the state and military. There's a reason why they declined. Yeah, and the Imperium is the same way. Thank you, bud. His eyes glinted like shards of dead stars there is as he no good lowered side to this. his glowing weapons, deactivating them and having them vanish up the sleeves of his robes. He was preparing for a different kind of battle. Tar could see this as well and looked upon the Sith Lord with mock pity. 
Unable to accept the inevitable? A shame. You will die flailing against the fate no one, not even I, can prevent now. The Inquisitor mocked. Sidious did not respond. At least, not with words which Tar Weiler could understand. Instead, he seemed to look down and speak to the flames themselves, his words strange and clipped. Weiler watched, his keen mind recording every word, though even then, his arrogance was supreme. The daemon fire he summoned was born of the most insatiable parts of the Immaterium. Children of a hunger so intense, even the dark gods made scarce use of it. Wielding it was to dance the line between existence and utter obliteration, and he had seen word bearers fail to coax the flames to stop. So Tar watched, watched and nothing more as Sidious spoke the hideous and lost tongue of the Balk. Masters of the Black Flame, speakers of the chaos. Tar had seen sorcerous attempts to put out the flame, to smother it, to deny it, to bribe it into release, to beg it for mercy. But Sidious did none of these. Kintik Hatsuska Otkaratak. Kintik Hatsuska Otkaratak. Jashen Sixa. Jashen Sixa. Well, Sidious spoke, summoning control. I believe this is what we heard during the preview. I believe this is what we heard during the preview. And it was just as. Yeah, yeah. I've been waiting for this. ...of the Black Flame. This, his communion with the Dark Side. Finishing the incantation, Sidious drew in a deep breath, and as he did, the flames were torn from his chest, entering his nostrils, and with flares of power which could be seen within his shadowed eyes, the fire was gone, and the Inquisitor was left Speechless, <laughs> for a moment at least. How? Tar finally managed. The flames are unquenchable. They do not relinquish prey. What part of this situation do you not get, Tartar Sauce? What part? They're out. How? He demanded, raising his rapier and pointing it at the Dark Lord of the Sith. Darth Sidious, He's gonna say the line. resplendent in his darkness, did not Going respond to say the right line. away, shadows deepening all around him as he finished breathing in the breath he had taken. He exhaled darkness in place say of the line. his breath long and dragged out, say it. Weiler's eyes darting, but unafraid. When Sidious say spoke the line, again, creamy. he did so in a deep, demonic voice that drew what little breath Ayla had out of her lungs. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities. The weak and short-sighted consider to be unnatural. <laughs> Tar edged back, <laughs> the air seeming to... Creamy Sheev has unlocked the achievement. Yes! Yes! Rumble without noise. He knew what this was. Just beyond the veil, on the other side of the border which protected the material plane, the warp was roiling, writhing, scratching and tearing at the seams. His beady black eyes widened as he- I like the modification, Baron. I like the modification. I like the modification that was made here. The dark side of the force, the path way to, to, to many abilities that the weak... <laughs> I love it! Yes! Yes, Mr. Galaxy Squad, cue Dark Souls boss music. Yes! Creamy Sheev has turned the curd. Thank you, Baron. Thank you, uh, thank you, Galaxy. I'm so used to looking here for my camera. I'm so used to looking over here for my camera. I keep on looking over there. I should be looking here. God! He realized for the first time 
that he was not dealing with anything as simple as a powerful witch sorcerer. Yes, you're not dealing with the average Saiyan anymore, Frieza. You are strong in the dark side, said the Sith, Ooh. stepping forward and dragging every shadow in the room with him. Worthy of the mantle. He purred, making the darkness around them shudder and draw in closer. What? I... Ah! Weiler began to say, before crying out, staggering, one hand holding his blade out towards Sidious, while the other suddenly clutched at his head, covering one of his hateful eyes. Ayla could feel it as well, a conduit, a powerful channel opening between them. Like water calls and connects to water, so too did the black hearts of these creatures connect and flow into one another. Yes, I can see it. Crooned the Dark Lord of the Sith. Such power you have, yet still a slave. Your chains, unbroken. He continued, stepping closer still. I am no slave! Tarweiler spat back, saliva frothing his lips as he attempted to drive apart the strange connection. I am an Inquisitor! A Lord Inquisitor of the Imperium of Man! Billions live and die by my whim! I command battle fleets and soldiers which shame anything you have ever wrought! My authority is the authority of a god! The Imperial roared in defiance. And yet, the Dark Lord said, seeming to almost whisper the words, although each syllable cut through the air like a razor blade, easily heard. It is not your authority. It is the authority of your dead god. Mocked Sidious. Oh! Silence! Snapped Tar, slashing his sword through the air to punctuate the statement. I am the greatest Inquisitor in the entire Zectec sector, and soon, the whole galaxy! The shark toothed man railed. So you wish to believe? The Sith Lord smoothly retorted. And yet, how true would that be? if the rest of your precious Inquisition knew. Said Sidious, stunning Tar with the breadth of the knowledge this connection had evidently bestowed. Knew what you really are. The Sith finished with a grin the Inquisitor could feel. The man could not be allowed to live or know anything more, Tarweiler determined, gritting his teeth and furrowing his smooth brow into an ocean of wrinkles. I am the Inquisition! You know what? I didn't know who to root for, but I'm pulling for the Senate right now, bitches! The Psyker bellowed, throwing himself forward in a charging lunge. But he did not complete the attack seeming to come up short just before striking Sidious, struggling against an invisible force. Gritting his teeth, grunting as he was frozen mid-charge, Tarweiler- The Senate is about to speak! Everybody might. shut the fuck up! The tip of his black rapier beginning to smoke, only an inch or so from Sidious's chest. The Dark Lord smiled, stepping closer and forcing Tar to slip. She activates Rose Scott mode. It was very effective. Yes, Hobbit. Baron says, not yet. Jack Leonard. Sidious's power is less than far Wilder's, but far more refined. Yes. Yes! Lied back. Thank you. The end of the Jack Leonard, Baron. Glowing Thank you, Hobbit. Hot. With a sudden burst of movement, Sidious snapped his left hand out to his side. The rapier, following, suddenly jerked out of Tarweiler's grip and spinning across the room to clatter against the wall. In the same instant, his right arm thrust forward right into Tarweiler's chest, exuding a force great enough to fold Durasteel. But 
only managing to shove the Inquisitor back about six feet. Staggered, but swiftly rising and regaining his composure, Tar Weiler reached out to his right, extending his will towards his sword, but paused then as Sidious shook his head. Why let Blades decide what malevolence should settle? The Damn! <laughs> the Senate has spoken. Lord suggested. I fucking love that line. Why let Blaze decide what malevolence should settle? Shit! An insidious proposal which challenged Tar's most vaunted asset. His psychic might. Very well. But remember when you find yourself screaming, your soul rent apart in the tempest of the warp. Recall this moment. Remember that it was you who challenged me and brought this upon yourself, Tar said. All right, look, you may be bald like Vin Diesel, but Vin Diesel delivered the line better, okay? He did. He did. So remember this moment. As he drew his hand back in and crossed his arms over his chest, forming an aquila, though each of his fingers was notably spread. Darth Sidious raised a hand almost daintily to his mouth and laughed. Clearly you have a talent for speaking threads, but I am afraid that now... I must teach you when to heed them, said the Dark Lord, raising his hands, touching his thumbs together, and forming a pyramid shape at the center of his chest. Oh, Boy. god damn it, I always knew Palpatine was TN from Team Four Star. For a moment, they seemed to hold, paused, one staring the other down, but... They were only still in a purely physical sense, as Ayla could feel. Behind their dark, burning eyes, the Force was splitting and being churned in a way <coughs> which defiled every teaching of the Jedi. Lightning burst from Sidious like a foul raiment of destructive hey, energy. Runner, you have a wonderful day, okay? And in response, a corona of brilliant, shimmering flame exploded like twin wings from Tar Weiler's back. The fires black, but edged in a brilliant gold. A fraction of an instant later, and the duel shifted from a physical to a metaphysical plane entirely. Ayla's eyes wide and bleeding as she continued to bear the burden of the witness. Sidious unleashed phantasmal Sith illusions. Demonic constructs of the dark side aimed to disorient and terrify. Now coming closer to true life than ever before. Wyler retaliated by ripping open the very fabric of reality. They're doing this shit. Ayla's sitting over there in the corner just watching. At some point they're going to remember she's there. At some point they're going to remember she's there. Somebody get this woman a drink. Somebody get her a drink now. Exposing both himself and his opponent to the roiling madness of the warp itself. Visions and nightmares clashed in a realm beyond corporeal understanding. A contest not of strength or martial skill, but of will, knowledge, and blackest insight. The Force was tearing itself apart devouring its own body as the two men commanded it against each other. And the room contorted violently, oh, rising boy. on contorting corrupted metal until it was no longer the ninth floor beneath the ground, but rather nine stories high into the air. A twisting and still rising tower of metal scrap that reached agonizingly towards the heaven. This would be like you thinking you're good at basketball. And then Michael Jordan in his prime and LeBron James show up and they just start dunking all over each other. And you're just standing there with your ball in your hand just like, yep. Ayla, just say fuck it and go home. Just get the fuck up and walk out. Just go. Just go home, Ayla. Go home. Go home. It's over. It's done. It's done. 
as reality was suffocated nearly onto the death of all logic. Ayla Sakura, her consciousness teetering on the edge of oblivion, realized then the unspeakable horror of her predicament. The predicament of her entire order and republic compared to this power. They were all but mere moths caught between two raging infernos, each capable of incinerating not just the body, but the very essence of any caught in their way. As Sidious and Wyler continued their unspeakable contest, now a clash of forbidden lore and dark power as much as one of weapons, Ayla felt the force itself shuddering, as if in anticipation of some terrible, irreversible fracture that was about to occur. Regardless of who emerged victorious, she understood one chilling fact. Both men were shepherds of cataclysm, architects of the apocalypse of not just this world, but countless others. Their darkness was not merely personal, but cosmic. Not merely physical, but metaphysical. And as she lay there, flinching at each crackle of dark energy and each scornful exchange of powers entirely antithetical to her own, a final thought intruded upon her fading awareness. She and the Jedi had never even stood a chance. This war... They are literally about to break the warp. They are about to break the damn warp. Mr. Galaxy Wild Tower, I'm gonna beat his redacted, the the, the cream. <laughs> Sick burns and random bowl. <laughs> yes. I hate it too, bud. No. The warp is pl the warp might have been placid, but this is just this is just not even right. To the, the, Zinch can smell this, like like right now. Forty like the gods and the gods of forty k are like looking over at Star Wars like. Anybody else hear that? Or had been over. Orcs versus Ewoks, yeah. Dude. I don't know how n every force gift sensitive in the galaxy is going to be feeling this, okay? Every force sensitive in the galaxy is going to be feeling this. Before it started, and as despair consumed the soul, that's of they're Ayla tearing Sakura, the warp apart. So too did darkness consume the waking world, and she fell away, knowing no more. Ayla's gonna wake up with a Sonashi tattoo. No, Obi-Wan Kenobi isn't like, I feel an disturbance in the Force. No, at this point, he's like, what the fuck is that? This just the beginning? Okay. Oh! Do I think a Chaos God could be spawned out of this? Yes. I think a Chaos God could be spawned out of this. Chaos God specific T. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much, Mr. Galaxy Mod. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, God. We're only 27 minutes into this. One of her slender hands slid across the exposed skin under her neural interface band wicking away sweat with the act and being forced to mentally negate the implied commands that the gesture issued to the Oracle computer system. A system that Omega was now very much a part of. Few of the previous battle simulations had pressed her this hard and none of them, not a single one, 
had borne the stakes this game now held over her. Omega flicked her wrist, readjust- Galaxy Y, don't say that. I'm at the- I'm at the part- Like, if you guys haven't read, uh, the end of the death part 2 yet, I'm reading it and there's some things going on with time right now. The Wills must be losing their minds right now. Yes, very, very true. Very true, Jack. Dusting the assault positions of countless warships with the act. Her commands then processed and disseminated by her team. In the black, insubstantial sea of the void, Venators banked, their engines burning like dim stars in the endless night between worlds. Their weapons fired in rapid succession, a chorus of colored plasma raining like hail, splashing and shattering upon the skins of the behemoths all around them. And every few moments, one of those monsters they had warred against would swat a swathe of them out of the darkness, mm. annihilating them with shells, cannons, and strafing lines of volatile energy. But the swarms of the Republic were many, and the gargantuan beasts of the Imperium were few. And Omega knew that she could win out with precision and ruthless application of the needed maneuvers. And so it had gone, with Omega and her many captains dueling against the Lord Admiral of the Imperium and the many lesser admirals beneath her, all of whom served as Omega's presumably simulated opponents. They exchanged blows, the ships and the steel of their bodies acting as the blades of their sabers as they dueled each other back and forth, a dozen metaphorical rapiers clashing, each held in as many arms between the two of them. Nearly an hour had passed, and already 56 different critical moments had been reached from small conflicts or skirmishes within the larger battle to heavy fighting and obviously prime priority engagements. No matter their apparent size, each and every single one of these 56 points had been situations which could change the flow of the battle and could have caused full reversals of her current momentum had even a single one soured badly enough. But Omega had managed to win or stalemate each and every single one so far, clearing her mind of all distractions seeking only what needed to be done to survive every critical encounter as they occurred, always looking to implement her larger strategy whenever she could. At the end of the day, no matter what intelligence she was facing, this battle, any battle, was just angles, numbers, possibilities, and probabilities. I keep on thinking about the what's going on with Weiler and Sidious and how much, how screwed up the warp is underneath there right now. And the fact that millions have died, if not billions have died on that planet, probably closer to billions at this point. And then this is happening overhead. And there's already been warp fuckery. How many Alpha Plus would it take to kill a Primark? Depends on the Primark. Th this is going to cause a problem. Nothing could overcome that fact, and that fact would not overcome Omega's will to see her small group remain whole. All around her, each one of the other clones that composed her impromptu family were struggling to keep pace with their young leader. A single moment, a tiny lapse, even a temporary hesitation could easily cost them 50 ships and tens of thousands of lives along with them. They all wanted to stay together just as badly as Omega. However, so Katana, two factors who else kept is them there at from matching Jack, the I don't know. speed and tactics of her moment-to-moment -moment commands. Firstly, she was simply superior. With a grasp of physics and tactics which bordered on the preternatural, Omega was so apt at reading and noticing details and patterns that even the... Alright, hold on a second. Fan, you just gave me a tell. I've been listening to this. I've been listening to this. Do you realize how many countless hours of days I have listened and pondered about this? No matter how bad things get, no matter how bad things get, Warpugs, 
They can always get worse. And they're about to get a lot fucking worse. Just some guy, don't forget the Crimson Razor Exterminatus 2. Yes. It's about to get fucking worse. Brace yourselves! The others in her group suspected that she may have somehow been cloned as a force sensitive. No. Nope. With an eye sharper than a vibroblade, and a mind born of the gene furnace that was what remained of Django Fett's existence. Omega did not lack for decisiveness either, and her application of tactics was either immediately effective or quickly corrected. And yet, even with this advantage, there was. Sebastian, hope is the first step on the road to disappointment. <laughs> I don't want to know what's about to hit, but I'm about to laugh. Was something else holding the others back that Omega was not bound to? One after the other, the clone children of Omega's strategy command team came to a realization that their leader was simply blind to, perhaps even subconsciously choosing to not see what they had all realized. This was not a simulation. This was real. These numbers were real. The Armada was real. Heard this the in Imperials the preview. were real. I was literally sitting here listening to the trailer for this and just like going, oh! And the sacrifices that they were making to keep their momentum going yes! and their victory assured was yes! certainly real. Tears dripped from unblinking eyes as commands were parsed and sent, hearts beating like leaden pumps in frail chests, every beat becoming harder and harder with each callous command they issued forth. But none, not one, had the heart or the will to tell Omega the truth, or to even signal it. For while parts of them died as tens of thousands perished at their orders, it was clear from the narrowness of their lead that each and every single one had been a required loss for the sake of victory. And so, Omega, unknowing, innocent goddess of death, danced and spun her strategy over the convulsing, dying masses of Republic and Imperial ships. More and more, the momentum was mounting. Further and further ahead did their victory take them, and all it had cost them to this moment was nearly a quarter and a half of their combined fleet strength. Most of those lost Republic ships did not meet their end in the direct battle that was occurring even now, however, for such mass losses in such a short amount of time would have been almost impossible to manage unless she had been trying to get her units obliterated. The whale-like behemoths of the Imperial fleet circled and spun lazily in the void sea, engines burning outlines into space like vast fins of fire as their enormous weapons belched sure death into the clouds and shoals of surrounding Republic vessels. But those overpowered weapons could only be so effective when overkill earned them nothing. And Omega had already sure. adopted strategies to keep each single blast of their gargantuan guns from destroying an optimum number of her own ships. No, the true lethal threat came from the vast line of even larger, stranger vessels who kept their distance from the body of the battle. Despite that distance, they their even... participation was no less present as they fired massive and varied weapons from their positions creating a myriad of destructive and debilitating effects across the entire battlefield. Gravitational wave bombs ripple the very fabric of space-time in a visible way. Novatic detonations exploded in fiery violence, briefly resembling stars in their expanding brilliance. Oh, the art mechanics is not here yet. Particulate torpedoes blossomed in ways which resembled brilliant fields of blue and purple flowers in the black backdrop of the battle, creating nebulas of crippling energies which could strip the functionality from a venator like a hurricane wind could blow out a candle. The battlefield condition... She's lost nearly half her fleet. The venators aren't getting away. The Imperials are jumping away. They're, they're warp jumping away from the fight. But the Venators aren't able to. 
She's lost three eighths of her fleet. <sighs> My God. Tensions continued to change, and Omega continued to adapt. The However, war pugs are losing. She did it. not seek out the distant bombarding behemoths, calculating that the overall battle would be harmed by splitting her forces. Even now, as wedge-shaped Republic ships splintered and burst on waves of unseen gravitational energy, or were burnt the molten know. in the embrace of sun-like explosions, the bleeding monsters of the Imperials began to die as well. And with each felled Imperial ship, much of their fleet strength would be bitten away. Each time an Imperial ship became too crippled by the ongoing battle or was destroyed by Republic vessels, at least two other Imperial ships would break off from their battle positions, anchor the vessel brutally with large chains, and drag it away into screaming, swirling portals of blue and black yeah, energy. Yeah, they're getting away. Thus, breaking one they're vessel getting meant away. subtracting three from the battle. An advantage that was rapidly giving Omega dominance in this contest. But only so long as their concentrated fire efforts remained consistent, and they could only remain consistent if she did not split her attack power in half. So, men died and fired, killed from behind by the enemies they were forbidden to pursue. The netherworld was flushed with the dead. But Omega could not feel their presence, nor could she hear their legion. Not until, suddenly, a small red line of script appeared in the corner of her vision, in the midst of her void-born duel with the Imperium. Connection error detected. Omega barely noticed it at first. It was someone else's problem, someone else's job. That changed quickly, as the illuminating panels of hologram projectors which surrounded her began to fail. Their projected three-dimensional screens going red and losing uh -oh. all detail one after another uh -oh. in quick succession. Uh -oh. the si Mr. Guy, so I mass death, alpha plus battle, demon summed, summoned, death of a ludicrous amount of stackers and the warp being stored up there by the amount of dying worlds. Yep, galaxy-wide, we are there. Same soon occurred on the monitors all of her supporting team were working on, the screens becoming crimson sheets with the word error written in white at the center. What the... Omega said, looking around in confusion. The others did much the same, with Arcanian angrily slapping his console with a wide hand to try to coax it back into function. Oh, no. Sprout slowly lifted his face away from the console, the blood draining from his features. Oh, did no. the simulator break? Omega added a moment later, just before the lights all suddenly oh, no. shut down, a deep whine in the ship walls signaling the powering down of the main engine. The clones found themselves awash in the darkness, blind until the lights suddenly came back on, another rising whine denoting the restart of the power systems as the ship came back online. No one came in for them. The door into the room did not open, and the glass observation center above them did not issue any commands, nor did its large glass window become any less opaque. Omega shrugged nervously, looking back at the projectors as they began to flicker back into life, the screens on the support consoles following suit. But even after reactivating, they were blank. Um, system response request? Manual access mode? Omega said to the computer, nervousness clear in her voice. Was troubleshooting part of the simulation test now? The holograms did not respond to her at first, before a single word written in white text appeared hovering before her. Omega squinted at the word and read it out loud. Receiving. Read Omega. Is that a bit strange? Asked Meek. The willowy clone cadet who stationed one of the lower consoles, the one to Omega's right. Yeah, aren't the system framework responses normally in a larger text? Sprout added, sitting right above Meek in one of the upper consoles. Oh, no. Also, it's in a different font too. Ally said from over Omega's shoulder. What are you guys whining about? Computer's probably got an upgrade that changed a few things. Let's get...
I got a feeling it's gonna be an upgrade, all right. This error worked out. You know what is happening every second. We are cut off from the Armada, right? Arcanian and Oh no! Is right. Sad. The dark side is gonna need a cigarette after this battle. Yeah, Jack. And Omega. Think about it. This simulation has been more detailed and complex than any we've had thus far. Oh, you I'm sweet not summer child. The computers could not handle it. It only makes sense that they would have gotten upgrades before this game began. She explained, unaware <coughs> of how her teammates cringed. All oh. of them know. Oh no! We are seeing the birth of the newest god of chaos. All hail the Crimson Cringe! X in chat for the Crimson Cringe! Knowing quite well that this was no simulation, and not a single one among them with the courage or motivation to tell her the truth. Oh. At least, not yet. Omega stretched and cracked her back a little before continuing. Okay, um, system check. What is stopping us from resuming the operation? Omega commanded, crossing her arms as she waited for a response. The previous message vanished and a single floating dot appeared in the air where it had been, blinking on and off for a few moments. I got a bad feeling then about this. Then it was replaced by another response, <laughs> which about Omega that chose four friends to are read out loud. I don't doubt it. Checking. What operation is not resuming currently? The young clone said, eyebrows askew in confusion which tainted the tone of her voice as she read the response. How can the computer not know its own operation? Ally asked, voice puzzled. Must be some kind of critical system error. Meek muttered. Do you think we can still troubleshoot our way through this? Asked Arcanian. Omega shrugged her shoulders and sighed, tapping her chin as Sprout bit his I'm gonna laugh my ass off. <laughs> if the message comes up on the screen, new phone, who dis and assemble the mechanic and slip. Come on, man! Give it to me! Serpentine and vile into his mind. Resume command and control operations over the current <laughs> Republic fleet action. Omega began to say new before phone, who Sprout dis? suddenly yelled and almost fell out of his console alcove. Omega, wait! He cried out. Don't tell it anything. The young clone finished, but it was too late now. The computer relayed the amount of her response that she had already spoken, and the dot returned, blinking once more. Oh, no. Sprout, what's wrong? Omega asked, befuddled by his outburst. But Sprout did not say anything. Eyes nailed to his console screen, and the blinking dot the he saw there, waiting for a response. And soon, the response came. Oh. Found you? Oh my oh! God. Even more confused than before. She looked over at Sprout, expecting him to elaborate. Oh, Great, but was shocked by the pained expression she found on his face. Omega, this isn't a simulation. This is a real battle against the real Imperium. And, and I think the enemy just found us. Sprout explained, and as if to punctuate his response, the ship suddenly shook violently. Omega oh, no. almost fell out of her command platform and blinked rapidly, the pieces in her mind starting to form into the tr <laughs> They're gonna ask her if she wants NordVPN. They're gonna ask her if she wants NordVPN. If you had a virtual private network, you wouldn't have had this fucking problem. <laughs> Thank you, Prophet. I wasn't tripping with the admin asking for the Wi-Fi. Truth, she had been refusing to see. Oh, no. She opened her mouth, oh, no. but could not speak. Tears beginning to rim her wide eyes as the profundity of her actions up to this point became clear. I'm sorry, Omega. I, I, I should have told you. One of us should have told you. But, but when Nala Se chose to lie, we just just assumed sprout tried to explain feeling an unexpected wetness in his own eyes and as he spoke the sound of kaminoans and clones beginning to scream started to barely penetrate the thick walls of their command center for indeed the imperium had found them had been waiting to find them and now that it had the imperium had sent an emissary <laughs> Bearing the Emperor's judgment and his mercy. <laughs> oh, no! 
hurts. This is like, no, they're hosed. He's here to check your extended warranty. Oh! Okay. Okay, I need a minute. I need a minute because, um, yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> no prizes for correct answers. Wouldn't have been a Calexus. Like, it wouldn't have been a Calexus. <laughs> oh my god, we're only 45 minutes in! Lazarus stood by, oh waiting god. behind the one way. Okay. I need a minute. Oh, I need to take a breather. Fan, you wrote it. He's <laughs> 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 like, it's like, don't blame me. <laughs> oh God, now my abs are hurting. Oh God, that sucks. All right, <laughs> take five, everyone. Take five. Take five. Oh my god.
today on Star Wars vs. 40K. Tar Weiler and Creamy Sheev get together to talk about their glory and wonder of the dark side and form the Tartar Sauce Alliance. Creamy Sheev and Tar Weiler. Also, if you tune in later, Omega gets the Omegon treatment. And filling in, since Rogel Dorn is still out with, you know, the pain glove, filling in will be an Evasaur assassin. Oh my god. Mm. I need to laugh less right now. <laughs> oh god. On a more serious note, do you think the mechanic is like to collect the colonic tech from it? Yeah, they would. They would definitely do that. Or they might consider it Xenos filth. I don't know. They were cloning humans. We'd see. It's still considered tech heresy, for the most part. Even the Vitae birthing wounds of Krieg are considered by many to be heresy. The mechanic is just pulled on equivalent of new phone who dis. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Galaxy Wide. Oh my god. I, I got I had I had to take a chill pill there for a second because if you see me laugh, if you see me like go into hysterical laughing fits, um, you know that like I have this thing that happens with my abdominal muscles. It was starting to happen, so I decided to give myself a a short breather on that one because holy god <sighs> Omega isn't gonna get the Anakin treatment. <sighs> Oh, man. Master Eversaw, you said you found us. What are you going to do? And nobody's surprised or disheartened when the, when things go horribly wrong. Yep. <sighs> Think Sutton Sellison can take on Sidious, yes or no? That is a toss-up, honestly. Diclonius, Omega didn't become nuke from aliens. Ugh. Oh. Mm. Oh. Yep, this hurts. One second, guys. Omega's luggage, she gets the Anakin treatment. Just some guy mechanic sent him with a new phone, new disc, and he slapped him with a this number is on a do not call list. <laughs> The Eversource shows up. I don't care who you send. I refuse to pay taxes. <sighs> oh, it is a good pain, Alpha. It is a good pain. All right, here we go. Glass as he lingered Exit in the observation for fan. room, what the fuck? watching as the examination was performed on the script he had been given. The long prayer scroll was covered from top to bottom in sloppy, low gothic. The terms for a ceasefire, not a surrender. Written in the blood of the Republic Witch Knight who had sent it, the message itself was barely intact anymore. Picked recordings now serving as the only records of what it had once said while complete. Servo surgeons and skulls extended their many limbs carefully down towards the paper, slicing segments away for piece by piece testing, all while members of the Medicaid and Hospitlar who had remained worked furiously over specific segments of the tattered prayer scroll, cutting small punch marks out of the pieces where the blood had been spilled most thickly. The methodical disassembling and testing was an absolute requirement, for while the handwriting had been sloppy, the terms within were enticing enough to warrant consideration. But, for consideration to be even a meager possibility, Farnus's claims had to be verified, and further, Lazarus had to ensure as much as possible that he was not dealing with anything worse than an abhuman mutant. Already they had confirmed that the blood which made up the script belonged to a heavily altered near-human, about 2% more divergent than an Ogryn. But not quite as divergent as a beastman abhuman strain, like the Felinids. Now they were test- So Circus not a cat is not a cat lady confirmed. Moving on. Testing for everything else. 
mutation, corruption, gene mimicry, and most importantly, the genetic taint of the subversive and monstrous gene stealers. Meanwhile, the other half of this message, that is to say, its bearer, Farnus Eliton, was being tested almost as thoroughly. Lazarus had chosen to oversee this instead of that, for by his own judgment, by his own reckoning, the young soldier had been telling the truth so far as he knew it, and was no traitor. Jack o Lantern, why do I think some species in the Star Wars galaxy qualify as ab humans? Um, most of the humanoid ones are going to be related to humans in some way, shape, or form. It's fan. All right, X in chat to nuke fan. Don't bring up blue blue milk. Don't bring up blue milk. No, 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 no. Lazarus could have used Thank his you, authority as a saint to spare the boy his tests. He could have vouched for him. Could have said that the emperor saw through his eyes and beheld nothing wrong with the guardsman messenger. But the stakes were too high. His own desperation for a solution was too intense, and the price of a mistake was potentially eternal. The fact that this was being considered at all was the highest form of recognition that Lazarus could afford to offer him. The rest he would need to prove to the interrogators and psychers who, even then, were busy scouring his mind for any trace of deception or omitted truth. I cannot believe that you are actually choosing to do this, said a familiar voice. Fan? No. 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 Voice behind him, Lazarus no. did not turn. Though it had been only a very short time. Alright, real quick, real quick. F and chat to flamethrower this entire thing and purify it real quick. F and chat to just purify this chat real quick, okay? Because you guys took a dark turn there. Time. Already he and she had verbally skirmished around this topic. But now, he felt she had the intention to finally hash this out. Taking a deep breath, Lazarus spoke. I haven't chosen to do anything yet, said the saint of the Imperium. The Emperor tells us that to merely consider a sin is to commit it in your heart, and you are considering this, said Leandra Ordain, dressed in a full panoply of powered armor once more, leaning carefully against the metal wall behind her, arms crossed. I am, Lazarus agreed. Picking his next words very carefully, though he still did not budge. I have to. I was given a directive from your mother, and if she has succeeded in somehow stopping the virus bomb from going off, then I must continue. I cannot squander Ishtara's miracle. I cannot surrender. Not even to death, he explained. Mm -hmm. Behind him, the Canoness commander made a sour face. And you think that... Okay, Cursed, um, if you don't know what that is, Last Jedi is part of the reason people hated that movie. I will say nothing more. Trusting the word of a Republic witch will somehow help you complete that directive? She asked with a frown. Lazarus's face creased as well, but not in a scowl, but rather a subtle smirk she could only barely see as a reflection against the observation window. I know that once, Ishtara herself worked with a Xenos witch. He said, matter-of-factly. Leandra seemed struck by that, blinking in open shock for a few moments huh. before gritting her teeth angrily. Elendia Sharkape, I think? It seemed to have worked out for her. Lazarus continued. That One second, the war crime cats are screaming. Excuse me. Excuse me. Angry. 
Where'd you go? There you are. <sighs> yep. Yep. <clears throat> the war crime cat was unhappy. Volcana was uh Okay, so we so if you guys don't know if you guys haven't seen me live in a little bit um the hospitaler wanted a cat. Well, I said that was okay. So she bring she brought home a cat. And then she probably brought home another cat. And then now I have a third cat. The cat that was doing the, the screaming just now, that is Celestine. You have another cat over there. And she doesn't like to be picked up, so... Come here, Celestine. Come here. They want to see you. Come here. Well, come here. You just going to stay underneath there now? Fine. Whatever. Now... The names of the cat are Celestine and Lotara. So... And the third cat is, uh, yeah, yeah, it's happening. Prophet, nuke yourself. Nuke yourself. What's I don't need nine cats. This. And besides, my mother killed that witch by the end of their dealings. Leandra sputtered in protest. She uncrossed her arms and stood up, pointing <coughs> an accusatory finger at Lazarus. How would you even know about... Leandra began to ask... Oh. Cut off a moment later by Lazarus as he finally turned around to look at her, his expression thoroughly bemused. Leandra, I have been given your mother's office and records and I have been combing through them for literally anything that will help us out of this. Anything. Naturally, I looked through Ishtara's dealings with Xenos in the past and it did not take me long to find this. It is an admittedly small file. He said with a shake of his head, and for the record, while your mother did kill the witch, it was not her plan to. The record clearly states that Ishtara was betrayed first and fought her way out, said the new saint. That is exactly my point! exclaimed Leandra, one fist slamming down into her opposite palm. You cannot trust it! If you do, this Ahsoka Tano will just end up betraying you! destroying you and all of us in the process uh -huh. she contended almost pleaded was your mother destroyed by the eldar witch when she dude would you not stop like lazarus you can't be resorting to your mom here the your mom things you can't be resorting to those he was betrayed lazarus asked back without missing a beat no but leandra began to say and that is exactly my point, Leandra, said Lazarus, spreading his arms in mild exasperation. What do you mean? She asked, clearly puzzled by his statement. What I mean is, if I have to choose between a certain pointless, if glorious death, and an inglorious betrayal by the hands of the wicked that I may yet survive, then I choose to be betrayed and fight my way out, just like your mother did. I will not simply accept a sure death at the end of Republic Blasters. Not without some victory or goal behind it. Lazarus explained. We might just be making it easier for them. She yelled back. You don't know that working with her will get us into a better position. Leandra shouted. No, I don't. Lazarus admitted, his hands out. Palms open appeasingly as he silently called for some calm. However, I do know that there are not many worse positions we can possibly be in. He said, Look, I may be a saint now, but I am a soldier and a leader of soldiers first and foremost. We have a little more than 600 men here, Leandra. When the Republic comes, if I can change or budge nothing, Mr. Godswad, thank you. In the end, the creamy tartar sauce have total dominion. Then they hear the only thing that will bring fear. Yes, Kyphus Kane, where is he right now? Hobbit, is Lazarus pulling a Yamam out of Canis? Yes, he is. He is doing that. Everybody, this is Celestine. This is the angry one.
Yes. They will you, destroy us up. and take everything we have here in the Basilica. If I can stall them, buy more time for things to change or adjust even, then it is worth the consideration. The beleaguered saint insisted. Leandro was already shaking her head even before he had finished speaking. And all of that will still happen, and we will still die if we choose to walk into an ambush they have set. The Canoness commander continued to contest. I know, Canoness. I know. I never said it's not a risk, or that it's even likely to succeed. But from where I'm standing, it's our only chance to influence the odds, even a little. Besides, me going isn't the same as me agreeing to any greater terms. And dying out there, or dying in here, at least I'll buy some time. The former sergeant explained with a resigned shrug. No, I cannot accept that. Leandra spat. It is not right that you should die first among all of us who have remained behind. She insisted. Lazarus could only chuckle at that, making her snap her eyes up at him. But before she could speak, he reminded her of something that sucked the next response out of her throat. Leandra, I already have. You cannot protect me from that. His words left a silence in the air, reminding the impetuous Canoness of the fact that, That's between really the two of them, it was he who stood at the Emperor's side, even if only for a moment. Not her. Thoughts boiled behind her eyes, emotions so powerful she could use them to burn even Lazarus alive. Yet, before either could speak again, the doors into the observation room slid open. Stepping in on metal legs which clinked and clanked against the stone floor, the current representative and highest ranking member of the Adeptus Mechanicus within the Basilica cut a tall, imposing figure. Okay. She was the Magos Domina <coughs> by the name of Aurora Sigmas, <coughs> a halo of servo skulls circling her hooded head. She had lost one arm in the battle, but seemed unbothered as she stalked forward, supporting herself on a tall, ritual cog axe of the Mechanicus faith. Ah. Saint Lazarus, I have returned from the interrogation room with news and a decision. She said without preamble. The saint turned to fully face her, giving a nod. All right. V for virus bomb on all you talking about milkies right now. Chat should not descend into this level of debauchery under any circumstance, so just virus bomb yourselves. Out of his head and quirking his eyebrows. A decision? What decision have you oh, made, no, Mago Sigma? Fan. He asked. I am prepared to enforce a position as the representative of the Adeptus Mechanicus here on this planet. She explained. Lazarus's quirked eyebrows raised higher. A position on what? Lazarus pressed. On the matter of this potential ceasefire negotiation. Aurora Sigmus further clarified. Lazarus sighed heavily and rubbed his eyebrows. Listen, Magos. While I do appreciate the power of the Adeptus Mechanicus and our need for unity in this situation, if that parchment comes back clean, and that interrogation follows, that I'm likely to... He began to say... Go to the ceasefire negotiation. Yes, the Adeptus Mechanicus are in favor of this course of action. There you she go. She interjected. The new saint blinked, face drawn in shock. That... That was not what I was expecting you to say. If I recall correctly, you were adamantly against the idea of negotiating yep, anything the with the one. Republic. Least of all for human lives. If you do not mind me asking, what changed your mind? Lazarus asked. In response, <gasps> the tech priestess leaned her axe against the wall and withdrew a data slate from the confines of her burnt red robes. She activated it and handed it to Lazarus, True, who took the device and looked down to see a picked image of the scroll that the Jedi Knight had sent to them. 
Several lines in particular were outlined in bright green boxes. The segments in question were a part of the Republic's guarantees, which would be offered merely for attending. Okay. The Republic had captured thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Imperials during their assaults. In part because of the stun capabilities of their weapons, and in part because of the Jedi army who had swiftly dismantled the PDF HQ. As part of the incentive for the Imperials to cooperate and attend the ceasefire negotiation, half of the prisoners the Republic now held would be turned over regardless of the results of the negotiation in question, so long as its parameters were kept. This had been a very large incentive for Lazarus for several years. They haven't reasons, even seen Titans but yet. But he was frankly shocked to find that it had any sway on a representative of the Adeptus Mechanicus. It's really he not looked going up to. from the data slate. There's some stuff going down. And gave her a puzzled expression. Do not mistake me. Saint Lazarus, I have not suddenly developed a capacity for sentimentalism. She said to him as she reached out to take back the data pad. Then, um, what exactly am I supposed to draw from what I read? He asked her, handing Night. it back. Twelve minutes ago, the interrogators succeeded in forcing an entire accurate recounting of events that private Farnus Leten had been withholding from his initial account oh. of the The priestess said, Oh, was he hiding something about this Jedi? Lazarus asked, but she shook her head no. He has been entirely truthful, so far as can be determined. Uh -huh. In regard to everything he has disclosed concerning the entity known as Asuka Tano and his brief time in Republic custody. She explained. However, prior to his encounter with the Jedi, he nice. met with a woman of my order. A knight adept designated as Nervashar. Yes! The priestess went on. Yes, he told me about her. She is one of the people set to be exchanged if we attend the ceasefire, oh. said Lazarus. Precisely. Affirmed Aurora. Nice. Repossessing her is of paramount importance to the Adeptus Mechanicus. As such, I do not only approve of your potential deceit. So basically this is not... A prisoner exchange, this is the repossession. Seems legit. Decision to attend, he demanded. Nerva Sharp must be recovered. The price or risk of such a thing is immaterial. The priestess revealed. Leandra sighed heavily and shook her head, and Lazarus gave a small smile. Well, at least it seems we are almost on the same page. He said, making Leandra groan again. Nice. Fine. But if we are deciding to attend this blasphemous exercise in futility, then we need to determine who is going and who is staying. Right. And what we will do if all of this turns into a trap. The canoness grated, straightening and cracking her neck. Let's go. About that. I've been considering that, and I think I know who I want to go with us. We must be prepared for failure or betrayal, but that does not mean we should sabotage our own chances at victory. True. Said Lazarus. Who are you considering? Asked Aurora Sigmus. Well, the three of us, for starters, but a few others as well. Somebody find that Inquisitor, <gasps> if he is still here and still alive. Mm -hmm. Also, Aurora, you just came from the interrogation rooms, right? What state was Farnus in when you last saw him? Um... Probably bad. Probably bad. Oh, hello! They're chewing straight through our cover, Captain! Yelled a clone sergeant who is kneeling nearby, left arm cradling a grenade launcher, right arm up and shielding his helm's face as stone chips flew and clattered against him and the others. Fordo did not respond, instead rolling his eyes inside of his helmet and hefting up the PLX missile launcher he had clutched in Here we both go. fists. What the cork is it with sergeants and stating the obvious? I guess it comes with the job description. <laughs> Fordo thought to himself as he prepared for a running start. 
Missile launcher held in both hands. A bandolier of grenades wrapped around his scorched armor. He and the clones were in the adjoining rooms that led up to the grand staircase in the center of the building, which was, at this level, a corporate headquarters from one of the planet's large distributors of mobile technology. Fan, I can make so many jokes right now. I can make so many jokes. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. But I could. Cell phones. Within the space not marines yet, had set up some fortifications. That clone has I'm actually trying to figure out a way where I can record that and upload that directly. Uh, I just don't know how I'm gonna do it. On the elaborate white marble stairs that led up from the center of the room, firing from tiered positions on the solid structure and preventing the forward movement of several converging clones. The room was of a hyper simplistic design with blank white walls of axamite marble shot through with veins of blue so deep and thin as to appear like subtle black script in the naturally cut stone. With the Marines set up on the curving rising staircase, yeah. their field of view for the room was nearly total, something they made destructive use of as indicated by the many red smears and man-sized do it. Plods of gore left near the entrances. The only real cover from the explosive slug throwers of the Imperial. All I gotta say is, like customer service at AT and T is taking on a whole new meaning. Damn it. Real Space Marines were the walls leading into the room, and the stairs that the super soldiers themselves were perched on. And as the sergeant had stated already. The marine guns were quickly widening the six entrances that led into the room as their heavy bolts smashed and detonated into the walls. Bordo took a quick, deep breath and checked his gear once more. Explosives secured to his waist, launcher firmly gripped. He nodded and reached down with a hand, activating one of the grenades which hung from his chest. The formidable clone did not, however, take it off from the bandolier, letting the beeping sphere lie against his armor. At the same time, Fordo also finalized a timed setting on his helmet, and without another word or delay, he took off running. What do I think the All Guardsman Party will be doing at this time? dealing with in this well nubby nubs would find some way to appropriate the entire child staff of omega she would snatch them this nubby would snatch them up right underneath the uh, ever sore sarge would be trying to face desk um twitch my spirit animal twitch he would have definitely blown up at least half the planet by now. Yes, Fordo, the Doom Master, Master Chief of Star Wars. This is true, Galaxy Wide. Flashbangs did not work on the Marines. At least Wolf not had very no clue. well. Aside from being able to recover from the effects with startling speed, the Space Marines often didn't suffer the effects at all. Shuttering huh. their helmets and closing their eyes in the brief instances of the initial flashes buying a second or two at best for those wishing to benefit from the flash grenades But not any more than that So the captain had devised a way of giving himself as much use as possible from those precious Porto couple was of the seconds. absolute him he ran at full Porto was not sprint so into the room, timing the firing of his first rocket with the sudden detonation of the flashbang on his chest. As he had programmed, his helmet sealed, visor darkening, his ears protected from sound as much as the helm could manage as the modified girl. Fan says, I am no heretic, but you are a hairy tech. You didn't go there. Come on. Come. 
Grenade burst in a shower of blind- Nuke fan! Nuke fan! Nuke him! Yes, Mr. Galaxy Mod, let's let him cook! ...light and sparks. The Marines, ever tracking movement and caught off guard by the maneuver, fired inaccurate shots into the glow. Their barking bolters narrowly avoiding the clone captain as he, blind and deaf, ran as straight as he could manage. The rocket he had fired flew rather wide, issued forth while he himself was blind and deaf. But his trajectory was good enough to keep him on target. Marines ducked as it smashed into and exploded upon an upper segment nice. of the stairs. The other clones drawing fire away from the insane charge of their captain by leaning out all at once and firing volleys of blue blaster bolts up into the marines. Their attack triggered by the burst of his grenade. The brilliance and relatively slow speed of the shots filling the air with further light and obscurement. When his helmet restored his vision and hearing, he found he was still dashing for his life. Heart hammering into his throat as the ground behind him was churned with fire and concussive right, force. Fordo yelled, feeling the chips of the shattered floor colliding with his shins as he pushed himself towards the shadows of the stairs with all his might. Muscles strained beneath his skin, some strands snapping with the force he needed to exert Ow. to stay just ahead of the stunned Marine's line of cascading death. Captain Fordo fired his second and last shot, tossing the launcher aside as the missile flew into the durable stairs and exploded, filling the room with even more dust and debris, amplifying what the first shot had already done. When he reached the other side, sliding under the shadow of the marble stairs and out of the direct view of the marines and their guns, he did so while dragging ragged breaths into his lungs. Nevertheless, he wasted no time, go, go, go away from where he had arrived, sliding into an alcove created by the curving stone staircase, expecting the marines to fire through the stairs themselves to try to destroy him. To his shock, they did not and he wasted not even a single precious second thanking his fortune or questioning their behavior as he unclipped the shaped charges from his belt this and dude. strapped them onto the base of the stairs. The explosives chimed, gravitic seals holding them tight to the stone surfaces as he primed them for detonation. The marines above Fordo made no move to intercede, for which he was grateful. Finishing his task with the bombs, the captain stood up and pressed his back against the marble of the stairs, sliding around to another spot, which was more exposed, but far enough away that he was willing to risk activating his explosives, slamming his thumb down on the detonator he held in his hand. Nice. The explosion this produced sent two molten lances of heat straight through the base of the marble stairs, shattering them and causing the structure the marines stood upon to crack and creak beneath their feet, even as they fired. The formidable Imperial warriors began to slide and lose their balance as the entire central structure of the stairs tilted, nearly tossing some of the marines to the ground. It was in Okay, this guy is a baller, okay? Do you realize do you realize how many there's how many creatures there are that can actually do what he's doing? That list is short, my guys. This moment that the next clone press came. Bellows and war cries resounding from the stone walls as the Republic's finest flooded in. The following battle was bloody to be certain, but decisive, even to a degree that surprised Captain Fordo. The Marines did not retreat, and they did not surrender, fighting to the very last amongst Damn, the rubble son. of the stairs. The clones took no quarter yeah, the as Marines they made a stake. learned from their previous encounters with the Astartes, knowing full well that to pull any punches or make any underestimations would mean death and worse. Yep. Feet. The troopers bombarded the struggling Imperial warriors with missiles, grenades, and laser cannons. And what scant cover the stone rubble provided was not enough. Each Marine riddled with ammunition until they finally ceased movement.
All the while, Captain Fordo could not shake the feeling that something was wrong. Oh. The sudden change in the Marine tactics, their willingness to lose men, to fight without withdrawal for goals that the clone captain could not discern. Oh boy. He was missing something here. And as he stared at the twitching, armored corpse of one of the half-buried Astartes, Fordo realized that whatever it was he was not seeing, it was big, very big, so big, he might not even see it if it were right in front of his it face. It probably is. Captain. Called a clone officer who came trotting up to Fordo. The captain turned to regard the trooper, who saluted and began to speak. Orders for you, sir. General Rancisis is requesting your aid. Aid with what? General Rancisis. Rancisis. Wow, your parents were really ill advised. Is your first name Physesis? Fordo asked, checking his weapons, loading his grenade launcher as he spoke. He is one level below us, sir, on the far south side of the building. He was trying to reach the next level by using some construction scaffolding they found laid out on the outside of the building, but they encountered entrenched space marines waiting for them. The clone reported. The general and his forces are currently pinned down out there, but now that we are above them... The soldier went on before Captain Fordo cut him off as he grabbed a fresh PLX launcher and shoved it into the reporting officer's hands. Nice. Right. We are moving out to outflank their entrenchment and pincer them between us. Have half our force remain here to secure the area no. and clear this rubble. I want to be able to proceed up to the next level when the general and I return. Ordered the captain. Yes, sir. Said the officer, saluting stiffly for a moment before turning to do as he was bidden, still holding the rocket launcher in his arms. Less than a minute later, Fordo was moving through the hallways and passages of the corporate HQ with a train of silent, ready clones prowling behind Damn. him, most armed with something big or explosive, or both. The sounds of barking Imperial weapons grew louder, Fordo raising his fist to halt the entire column behind him. He paused to listen, hearing that horrible, thundering sound, and more distantly, what must have a been lot, the returning yeah. fire from PLX launchers and blaster rifles. He gave a quick nod, gesturing with his raised hand as he and the other clones resumed their forward march, walking a little more slowly now, a little more stealthily. They reached a unit of multi-tiered apartment blocks here, those buildings which had prioritized an outside view, and Fordo raised his fist once more. He looked around, noticing several avenues to approach from, scanning his helmet from right to left, seeing multiple doors which led to multiple hallways that ran in the direction they were heading in, some slightly higher, or lower, or leveled. Fordo changed his raised fist, extending all five fingers before pumping his hand twice. Nice. The clones behind him organizing into five even groupings in rapid response. He wiggled his thumb then, before making a fist with two fingers extended and pointing at a narrow maintenance crawl space. The leader of the first group nodded, making a quick gesture with his right hand, high for the others of his unit to notice. Before huh. proceeding forward into the space, the men behind him following smoothly in tow, Fordo raised his hand again, extending all fingers and wiggling his pointer finger before making another fist with two extended fingers. He used the two fingers to gesture towards a door which led into a hallway at the far end of the room, and again, a trooper nodded, signaling for his men in the second group to follow and heading that way. We're deploying. And so it went, Fordo rapidly deploying each group into a different approach, until at last, it was only himself left, and the fifth group, his Group. Oh boy. He raised a pinky finger alone, not bothering to wiggle it as he curved his wrist twice, the clones taking his Ooh. meaning and following after Captain Fordo as he took the central, most direct route. The lighting in the corridor was patchy and damaged, leaving illuminating stripes of white between the motes of thick blackness that the clones and their glowing visored helmets passed through. 
Doors lined either side, luxury apartments for the executives. The wide spacing between each door alluding to the amount of room each one contained within. Okay. Finally, Fordo stopped, holding up a fist to halt everyone else, several fists rising in the line behind him to help the order silently carry itself further back. The sound was veering away now, and the captain judged it was time to head for the true side of the building. He flicked through a number of gestures over yeah, his head, directing more squads of troops to split off from his force and line up along the doors in the hallway on one side. He knelt next to his own, gave the execution gesture to trigger the advance, mm. and tried to open the door in front of him. It was locked, Bad but sign. that did not halt him. As a long, customized vibroblade slid out of his knuckle guard, humming gently as he inserted it into the crevice between the door and wall and sawed it through the door locks. Once done, the extended murmuring blade folded back in and the captain pushed the now limp portal in to one side. Fordo and his men stalked forward, visors glowing like Predator's eyes in the dark. The large... This guy is legitimate okay this is giving me kind of night lordish vibes right now i'm just saying sweet like apartment had a living room with a high ceiling with three floors beside the living room connecting it through a kitchen and a bar area or hanging indoor balconies Fordo fanned his hand to the right, yep. sending several men towards the tiered floors, ensuring nothing unpleasant was waiting for them there. In the meantime, Fordo and the rest of the men in the squad he was leading continued straight onward through the living room, carefully checking around the small stairs in the den and the rich furniture and piano-like instrument which dominated one side of a dining area. Their destination was the wide balcony, which awaited them opposite the door they had entered. But just before arriving there, a tap on Fordo's shoulder had him turning as one of his troops directed his attention silently up to one of the indoor balconies that connected into the larger living room. Standing up there was another trooper, who made a circular gesture with one hand and then extended three fingers with the same hand. The information conveyed was that they had found three civilians. Fordo quickly made a pumping backward gesture with one hand and then extended one finger, communicating for the civilians to be evacuated out of the area by one clone. I love the attention to detail here with each individual symbol being explained because sign language is really a thing when military matters are in play. So the I'm trooper really at the balcony this. saluted and turned away. With another gesture, Fordo and his men silently slid open the glass balcony doors, the sounds of battle flooding into the space in the form of the barking of bolters and the echoing screech of blaster fire, all occasionally interspersed with the boom of explosions. Creeping out and peeking down, the clone captain found that they had arrived in the right place. Below him, by about 20 feet, was the battle itself. The Marines nested on a wide platform oh, built boy. into the construction scaffolds. They were firing from behind cover they had created from the building materials that had been there before, standing in small clusters as they fired down at the forces of Opo Rancesis. He and the clones of his army... Opo Rancesis, I can't get over that name. ...were desperately firing back to try to keep the heads of the Space Marines down. But even now, the clone captain could see that the losses were mounting for their side, with pathetically few to show for the Space Marines. The area the Astartes were occupying had been meant to receive physical materials, and so was wider and sturdier than the other structures around it, making it the perfect place to force back anyone attempting oh to use the God. scaffolding to ascend higher into the building. However, it was exposed from above, I where Fordo and his troopers turn. I wouldn't be surprised, Sebastian, if this is that if that is a canon name. I've seen weird names before. That is one of the weird ones. They were, and soon the captain saw that he was not alone. In other balconies to his left and right, and crouching in the scaffolding behind the Astartes, as well as leaning out from the maintenance hatches around them, 
He could see the rest of his brothers were in position as well, and they were waiting for him. This time, he did not use a hand sign. <laughs> Instead, his grenade launcher in both hands rising from his cover, nice. shadowing his movements. The troops around and behind him and in other balconies rose with their own weapons less than a second behind Captain Fordo yeah, when he a, pulled the trigger. 100% cannon. Okay, nice. On his launcher, missiles, grenades, and blasters of laser cannon quality fell from the upper levels of the massive superstructure and directly into the clusters of space marines below. Uh. The Astartes barely had time to register the new attacks and react before the clones behind them charged as well, roaring and firing as they came. Needing no synchronization thanks to Oppo Rancis' battle meditation, their nice. timing was perfect. Rancis' forces closing in at the same moment, clamping down on the marine hardpoint from three different directions. This time, the vaunted super soldiers of the tyrannical Imperium lasted only seconds, mm. drowned in heat and explosions, the last three breaking from their firing line to charge the oncoming clones, all of them felled in quick succession by the humming blades of the Jedi General that led them. Yet, in the face of this even greater sudden victory, Fordo felt no elation. No true sense of victory. Something was nagging at him. In fact, okay. several somethings. Concerns that his warrior's subconscious had recognized, but his present mind could only grasp at. Captain! Asked a wizened alien voice. Fordo looked up and saw that General Rancesis and his forces had reached the building proper, and that the Jedi had sought him out as he ruminated on the balcony waiting for their clones to regroup. General, said the captain, snapping a salute. Nice. I'm sorry, sir. I was just, just thinking, sir. He reported. Good, good, The good old Jedi over. Master raised a thickly furred eyebrow at that nice. and extended one of his four arms, rubbing his chin. Is that so? Why not tell me about those thoughts? The Master pressed. It's, it's nothing, General. Really, I haven't got anything more specific than a bad feeling. The clone began to say before being cut off by a wave of Rancis' hand. Oh boy. I insist, Captain. The Jedi said in response. Nice. Fordo paused then to gather his thoughts, nice. giving a sharp nod before continuing. Right, like I was saying, sir, it's nothing precise, but... The clone started saying, But... Rancis pushed. But something isn't right about all of this, sir. Huh. Fordo managed to say, Oh... What isn't right about this? We entrapped them, destroyed them. The Jedi countered. Yes, but why did they let us? Fordo said suddenly. How do you mean? I do not think they had much of a choice if they wanted to stop my column's advance. Asked um... the Jedi. Yes, but what I mean is, why did they want to stop your advance? Why here? Fordo began to explain. Oh boy. We've been chasing the Marines up this tower exchanging fire with them all the way up. We are getting close to the top, but there are still plenty of floors, and we've seen how careful they are with their engagements. So what made stopping you here so important? The clone captain elaborated, looking down at the shattered remains of the space marines as they spoke, most covered in the debris of their own impromptu fortifications. Go on, Captain! The Jedi yeah. Master coaxed, and Fordo obliged. Cousin It, listen to the guy, he's making sense. We already took control of the floor they were preventing you from accessing, and they must still have access to their own comnet. We have no proper countermeasures in place to stop or jam it after all. So they should have known, should have known to pull back, like they have been. Should have known that they would be surrounded if they stayed in place. The captain said, gesturing down at the broken remains of the Imperial holdouts. It is. It's really good, And Father. it's not just that their placement and holdouts made no sense. They aren't the same anymore. I don't know if they are just sacrificing the old soldiers or the new recruits, but space marines are dynamic, mobile. These marines only ever tried to engage in melee after it was clear that their position was hopeless. Mm -hmm. Yet they waited until the last second to charge the line. 
Fordo shook his head as Listen he spoke. Listen to him. They know we are ill-equipped to deal with them in close quarters, and they know we cannot fire PLXs or toss grenades at them while they are in amongst our forces. Jedi are the only effective counter, and you were the only lit saber in your front Effective? Front line. They should have charged you the instant they realized they were surrounded, and they didn't. I don't know how to explain any of that. The clone concluded. Hmm. Neither do I. And you are not the only one to notice. Perhaps someone else on our side has done something to scramble their command or cohesion. But that is, in honesty, not the sense that I get from all of this. The Jedi Master concurred. We keep rushing ahead, trying to pin them down, trying to press their backs to the top of the tower. But I am starting to wonder if we may not be progressing into a trap. You think? The Republic General admitted at length, but by that time, Fordo was no longer listening, Thank you. having spotted something odd as he looked down upon the bodies of the Space Marines. Hold on, General. The clone said, excusing himself as he ran off from the balcony and around to where the upper scaffolding connected to the floor he was on, making his way rapidly to where the Marine lay. The Jedi slithered behind uh... him, more than a little curious as to what had pulled the clone's attention away from their conversation. What do you see? Oppo asked as Fordo went to kneel beside one of the damaged Space Marine bodies. It's not Fordo a space did not marine? answer right away, examining the scene under him carefully. The right arm of this Marine, or at least the armor of the right arm, had been blown clean off by a few concurrent detonations. Left in its place was what Fordo had, at first, assumed was the shredded remains of the Marine's arm underneath, but upon closer inspection, Fordo could see that the arm was mostly intact, and it was utterly wrong. General, uh, look at this Marine's arm. Isn't it a little small for a space Marine? Fan? Fan? Reference! The clone asked. Opo raised himself a bit on his tail for a better look, and after a moment of rubbing his bearded chin, nodded. Yes, perhaps a smaller space marine. You just got baited. The serpentine alien offered, but Fordo shook his head, bending over the marine's helmet, modified vibroblade unfolding from his knuckles. Too small for a space marine, I think was the clone's response as he cut his way through the seals in the marine's helmet, yanking on it a few times before it came loose, and made breathless both men who observed what lay beneath. Staring back up at Captain Fordo, open eyes glossy and dead, was his own face. The face of a Republic clone. What? Oppo hissed and Wait, what? Opa Rancis is a Jedi Council member and survived Order 66. He is 200 years old and was the parented of y Yaddle. He is very wise. He pulls off the helmet as a purple orc. Yeah, I, I pretty much... Yeah, yeah. I think they just got baited. Shock, recoiling, and though Fordo himself did not budge or flinch at the sight, a cold sliver of sensation slid into his guts and up his spine, every hair on his body standing on end. Traitors! The Jedi no. Master tried to rationalize, but Fordo shook his head, noting the large neck wound the clone had, a wound which was not reflected in the armor. Decoys! Fordo corrected. But how? The Jedi asked as he leaned in again. Uh oh. As he did, Fordo was already on the comms, hand to the side of his helmet. Lieutenant Trigger, I need you to do something for me right away. I need you to cut the helmet off one of the marine corpses you have down there and tell me what the face inside looks like. Don't uh -oh. ask. Just do it, trooper. The cat just, just some guy. They pulled off the helmet and it was the Bane Blade! Technically, we don't know where Creed is right now. Captain ordered before he turned back Not to the Jedi universe. Master. I suspect these are our own men from this fight. They must have taken corpses from us at some point in the chaos. It would not be difficult. 
as for how they are moving. Look at these suits, General. They are completely mechanized. Oh. They probably do not need any extra help from the wearer to move around and carry themselves. Just likely not as agilely or as smart as they would otherwise. Oh my goodness. Most... Mr. Pika, hey, thanks, bud. Most of the Space Marines they've been fighting this tire have been clone troopers. Where they live in their dead, we don't know. It's a trap. It is a trap. It is a trap. Captain Fordo deduced. So, we haven't been fighting the Marines this whole time. Say the line. Just their automated armors. Ask the Serpentine General. <laughs> Fordo shook his Guy head. Guy a bridge, no, nice. We have definitely been fighting Space Marines for the majority of this time. I would know. I killed one. There was a monster inside that helmet, and like I said, they move very differently without Space Marines inside. No. No. General, I think this is recent. Uh oh The captain informed, before tilting his head to the side, receiving a message on his comm. Hey, recent and not unique. Foro added a moment later. They pulled this stunt with me as well, further ahead. Something is happening, General. They didn't switch tactics for no reason. The clone asserted, looking around warily. Yes, but what reason could they have to hold us here, to stall? Asked the Jedi General, but he was not answered by his captain this time. In oh, place boy. of Fordo's voice, the screaming engines of several departing Thunderhawk gunships and variants answered the question Bye. of Opo Rancesis and slowly began to answer an unspoken question of Captain Fordo. Goodbye. Ah, a cover for their retreat. Having deployed their artillery strike, their purpose must uh, be concluded. No. Nope. The Jedi said as he watched the booming departure of the nope. many, many ships, shading his eyes with one of his larger arms. But Captain Fordo did not buy it for a second. It's not done no, yet. General, they never retreat. Not like this. No. Nope. Said the clone captain, and Oppo's face nope. stiffened at the sound. No, no, Captain. They do not. Was the Jedi's reply the same sinking realization yeah, falling Hobbit. upon him as well? They both exploded into action then, each acting very differently. Opal Rancesis withdrew his holodisc with a snap pull of the force, the object flying into his palm from his robes. He activated it. Say the line! Our gunships, converge on the towers and begin evacuating all forces from the... He began to order frantically, but was cut off by the actions of Captain Fordo. The captain had slipped off his grenade launcher, tossed aside his blaster, and then turned towards his general. Without warning or preamble, the clone tackled the large Jedi right in the chest, throwing himself against the stunned form of Opo Rancesis, okay. and tossing them both off of the scaffolding and into the yawning pit of Axum's nearly bottomless expanse. Yeah, time to leave. Ordo clutched the Jedi tight, holding their falling, tumbling bodies together, even as the bone-rattling shockwaves of the detonating Melda charges passed over them, tossing the two like leaves in the wind. Dude, Ordo Ford did was not it, see man. what occurred on the Axumite Tower. Too busy staring downward, using his body to ensure that he and his general were aerially maneuvered out of the way of any platforms, Dude. roads, or obstructions. The clone captain knew well that if he did this correctly, the gunships would have at least 10 minutes to catch them out of the air, with the hardest part for him being staying conscious after the shockwaves had passed. Yep. But the Jedi general he carried down with him had his eyes fixed onto the tower as they fell away from it. Wide spheres watching what happened next, soul sundering as he felt the depths of his precious clones through the connection of his battle meditation. Oof. The massive ship caliber melta charges fired molten hot streams of superheated material downward, boring uh. enormous holes through the centers of the besieged and occupied oh, buildings in no. mere milliseconds. Then. An instant afterwards, superheated winds and force snapped out from those entirely burnt out cores. That the windows sucks. and all of the affected structures blowing outward to form a dazzling mist of shards around each one. And even as these glittering shrouds were formed from oh. the draconic exhalation of the charges, the structures themselves began to rapidly sink inwards towards the gaping molten cavities which had been left within them no 
Oppo Rancisis lamented into the howling wind around him. Yes! Bearing cruel witness to the efficacy and utter lethality of the tempered hands and their strategic withdrawal. Ah. War pugs. I think that was an entire legion of clones that just went up in smoke, like 10,000 clones. It was a lot. I don't know if it was a full legion, but it was definitely a lot. And that building is very tall. Wow. So, Warpugs, we are going to save the rest of this for tomorrow night. We are going to save the rest of this for tomorrow night because about this time of night, the hospital becomes coming getting cagey and she begins getting ready to beat the crap out of me if I don't get up off this chair. Oh, wow. We are going to come back to the fight between Palpatine and Tar Weiler. Palpatine and Tar Weiler. Yes, the leg is right over there. The Republic just got told to get bent in their first real encounter with the Star Taste. It'll be raining bloody parts for at least a few days now. This is true. All right, fine, I'll get it. Hold on a second. I'll get it. I'll get it. One second. Because you guys asked so nicely. Because you guys asked so nicely, I'll get it. <sighs> now, I understand that Fordo had to leg it there. I understand that entirely. Luckily, he sensed there was a plot afoot. And he managed to get something done with it. Yeah. The plot was definitely afoot. He got out of there. Um, it is... Yes... Tarweiler, I'm not sure, I'm not really sure what he's going to do against Creamy Sheev, okay? I'm not really sure what he's going to do against Creamy Sheev, I just don't know. I'm not even sure who, this, who the heel of the story is right now either, because Ayla's unconscious, and I don't know whether to cheer for, you know, Sidious, or I don't know to cheer for Sidious, or I don't, I don't know if I should cheer for Tarweiler at this point. I just don't know. Um, the biggest question is who is going to bend the knee? That's the really big question, okay? Tarweiler is not a good boy. Level 100 pay to win player versus uh, level 90 players been playing since launch. Yes, that's pretty much what it boils down to. Guys, I said when I started to come into this, uh, when I came into this, there was no better stream for me to just show you guys the stuff that I've been working on in the background. I'm going to have more done tomorrow. I'm probably going to have the second coat done tomorrow, so it's not much is going to change. But in the next few days, you're going to be seeing... The cabinet began to assemble. The LEDs, everything like that. Um, so, Warpugs, this is this is what I wanted to do for 20k. 
I wanted to get everything repainted. I wanted to change the way this, the, the uh, everything looked. X in chat if you had fun, guys. X in chat if you had fun. Do not start mentioning that. Do not start mentioning that at all. I do not want to hear about that at all. Tarwala becomes Anakin's apprentice. I doubt. <laughs> Much doubt. Much confusion. Warpugs, I'm going to set up the stream for tomorrow night. You guys, I will see you tomorrow night. We're going to finish out this, hopefully finish out this fight. Hopefully this fight will be finished out. Thank you for joining me. Excellent chat for fan. I will catch you guys next time. And I hope you guys like what's going to be showing up here in the next few days. Until then, I'll catch you guys next time.